Good evening, everybody. My name's Tim Green. I'm the director of the Energy Futures Lab, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Marco Malley. Uh, he's not a stranger to Imperial College by any means. He's uh, been on the campus several times, particularly in connection with helping uh, UKIRK and some of its work, but also as a collaborator with, with several of us on, on the campus. Um, Mark's had a distinguished academic career at University College uh, Dublin, where he's a professor, and built up a large team in, in electrical power networks um, and the Energy Research Centre, and some uh, important strategic relationships with the ESB and Airgrid in, in Ireland, but internationally with um, Department of Energy and uh, National Renewable Energy Lab in, in the US, um, and is known for his work on the integration of renewables in, in island nations systems and the management of inter intermittency. Um, you'll see from his talk and from, from his title of his talk that he's in more recent years moved to take a broader view of, of energy and he's been leading UCD's Energy Institute for a number of years and importantly was a co-founder of the International Institute for Energy Systems Integration, a topic which I think many of us in this room will know is an important part of, of our view of what the future of energy should be. Um, so I don't want to uh, steal Mark's thunder and, and um, get in your way, so I'm, it's my great pleasure to hand over to Mark for his lecture. Thank you. What do I do now? Turn it on. Turn it on. The Irish health isn't much good. <laughs> You're the expert, not me. Okay, good night. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thanks. So before I start, I want to thank Tim uh, and Goran in particular for the hospitality they've shown me here over many years. So uh, uh, they've always been, the lunches are really good. <laughs> but then again, there was a dinner in Dublin that trumps them all. <laughs> Agreed. So Tim is still trying to pay back for the, for the dinner. Someday I'll tell you about that. It was an interesting dinner. Okay, so uh, I've got 61 slides. I, I, you know, I could spend an hour, but I won't. I'll spend around 40 minutes. I'll go through it pretty quickly and see if you've got some questions. So I've changed the title. Um, prerogative of the person here up in the front, I can change the title. It was called Integrated Energy Systems and the Role in Integrating. So I've just changed it around, Energy System Integration. It's the same thing. So let's talk about it. I'll talk about what I mean by it, a definition. In fact, we've just, we're just about to publish a, a, a short paper trying to define what we mean by it. Because I think, in fact, that's one of the problems, is what does it actually mean? Uh, and that's something that people are struggling with. So we've just published something on our website. Uh, well, sorry, it isn't published yet. It's been published shortly. So I'll, I'll try to define it very quickly. I will, after my conversations with Goran over the last 24 hours, I decided ESI and, how, and the low carbon agenda, including, it's mainly going to be about renewables integration, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about low carbon, because it's not just about renewables. You know, efficiency is a low carbon agenda, and energy system integration has a role to play in that. The part that I know about most is about integrating renewables, so I decided to put in low carbon. I'll talk about some of the international activities in the conclusion. So here's a definition. Um, I welcome any comments on it now. And in fact, if anyone wants to ask a question, what I, you know, I'd rather take the questions now uh, than later, but whatever, whatever, whatever you, way you feel. This is our definition so far. Energy system integration is the process of coordinating the operation and planning of energy systems across multiple pathways and geographical scales in order to deliver reliable, cost-effective energy services with less impact on the environment. We think it's reasonable. It's not perfect. You know, you try to put a definition into one sentence. It's always a struggle, but that's what we got at the moment. But I suppose graphically is the best way to show it. So what we're trying to say is that this is a graphic that comes from this is, yeah. So this comes from NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, who I do a lot of. I spent a sabbatical there in 2008, and I've continued to work with them ever since. Uh, so myself and some people in NREL with some, we're, I'm not a graphic artist, obviously, but they have great graphic artists, and they came up with this. So we're trying to show it that these are scaled. So this is single technology, campus to regional. So we're trying to get the sense of this, this building to this city to this big continental system. So that's across scale. We're also trying to look at the various vectors, electricity, thermal fuels. Data is not an energy vector, obviously. Well, I suppose it is to some extent, if you think, but it's small energy. But it's a huge enabler of this. 
and water as well. It's not an energy vector, but I'll talk a little bit about that. So we believe it's sort of the integration of these. So these are sort of key statements about it. Optimization, what, actually, what does optimization mean in this context? It's not just a simple equation. Any applied mathematician in here who thinks he understands that word, in this context, he doesn't. And why? Because the consumer is involved. and They do not obey any models of mathematics. They, they do their own thing. So it's optimization across multiple pathways and scales. What's it trying to do? Increase reliability, performance, minimize cost, environmental impact. So you'll see when I give some examples that if you take a holistic picture of the whole system across scales and across vectors, you can increase efficiency and, imp and increase the amount of renewables you put in the system, which reduces carbon, which has to do with, with sustainability. Uh, some people, when they see this, they say to me, Mark, that is everything. And in many ways, you could, it's not everything, though. We're only interested in at the interfaces where the coupling and interactions are strong and there's challenges or opportunities. So in other words, where there's places where these interactions across scale or across vectors cause you a problem, where that's a place we want to solve that problem, or where those interactions give you an opportunity. So it is quite focused. It's not everything. And the control variables are technical, economic, and regular. So we're not just talking about engineering. We're talking about economics, regulation, et cetera. And in fact, go even further. We're talking about uh, human behavior as well. Water. Um, I think it's worth mentioning it. Water has two roles to play in this. One is, this is a, a, a slide. It, I, sh I keep on rem forgetting. I should put in use with permission. It is used with permission. So gee, have it let me use it? Well, they let me use it once. So <laughs> <laughs> I continue to use it. But it's a very interesting slide shown by Bettler Rose from GE. And it, it says, you know, 47% of global water rely on power production resides in areas of significant water stress. Now, that's water to cool, OK? But also, so that's water enabling energy. But also, water is a huge user of energy. So if you take California, for example, 19% of all electricity in California is used to pump or process water. I think in Ireland it's around 6 or 7%. We're, not, we're actually not sure. <clears throat> but you know, if you pump water and process water, so we think water is a very important sort of element of this. It's obviously multidisciplinary, a great word that people use. It's got you know regulation, economics, engineering, etc. So that's a sort of introduction to it. I'm I then decided to take a sort of a geographical approach to this. Um, I'm going to talk about Ireland, Denmark, Europe. I can't remember where else. China. I'm going to talk about a few, and, and I'm going to use them as sort of examples. Okay. So Ireland, my own country, you all know where it is? Yeah? Will it be politically correct? <laughs> so Ireland. So at the moment, in 2015, provisional numbers show that we got 24% of our electricity from wind. We're an island system. Uh, and you can see it's grown pretty dramatically over the last number of years. We're on our way to 40% by 2020, which is about four years away. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, uh, actually, it's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons that the research group that I lead has grown dramatically in the last while. In order to make this target, that's required an awful lot of work. And because we're an island system, we actually have some problems that no one else in the world has. And I'll speak about them as well. Uh, <coughs> on our website, we actually monitor the wind penetration. We, we strip it off the ESB and AirGrid's websites, and we, 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 uh, we present it. Uh, it hasn't been very windy recently. In fact, all over Europe, it's been quite non-windy in the last while. So usually, I'm able to pick a very recent few days and pick a very high penetration. But in fact, recently, it hasn't been that windy. So about a month ago, it was a very high wind penetration in Ireland. And you can see that 60% of our electricity, approximately 60% of electricity was been produced by wind. It's in the middle of the night because the load is low, et cetera. It's very important to point out that this, is, this does not display S and SP. And I'll explain what that is later, so don't ask me. That. But it's very important to point that out, OK? And I'll tell you why in a minute. So we do get an awful lot of electricity from wind. Um, people talk about, who in the room understands the word flexibility? Hands up. Do you do yoga, yeah? The word flexibility has been coined in this area. I don't know when it started, but it's become one of the buzzwords of the area. Around 10 years ago, I didn't think anyone mentioned it. But, and I'm probably one of the people who's promoted it. I have to accept that maybe I'm partly to blame. But flexibility, in its very simplest form, is represented by this diagram. Uh, it comes from Michael Milligan from NREL, from National Renewable Energy Lab. 
And if you know anything about power systems, you'll understand that we must maintain supply-demand balance yeah, almost instantly. If we don't, we, the system blacks out, et cetera. So what you've got here is you've got the load without wind and the load with wind. And you can see the arrow is pointing to it. That when you put in wind, whoops, sorry. So here's the, here's the load profile, okay, as it usually is. If you put in wind, you know, the economist will, you know, economically, it's got zero marginal cost. You've put on its capital investment issue. You will try and take it off. Sometimes you can't, but you'll try and take it off. Therefore, from an economic point of view, your, the rest of the system will try and match this blue profile. And as you can see, the blue and red profile are different. The blue profile is a bit more dramatic. You have to go down lower, and you have to go down faster. And that's flexibility, okay? So flexibility is sort of the key issue in this area at the moment, and I'll mention it several times. So how does Ireland do it? How, why we, We're an island system. Uh, we have two interconnectors, but they're DC. They're quite small relative to our system size. And how do we do it? Well, in fact, how we do it is gas. We have an awful lot of gas generation. You can see this diagram here. This is gas generation. Sorry, gas, gas. Yeah, this is gas. So, you know, and this is for, is it? Yeah, February 2016, so pretty recent. So, you know, 40% of the rest of the generation was from gas. And in, that, in the month of May, you can see the renewables was 30%. Because we're at 25% approximately now, maybe a little bit more, but the winter, it's windier than the summer, so we can get up to penetration levels of 30%, 35% during the winter. During the summer, it's lower. So you can see that pr pretty much our system for February was gas and renewables and some coal. And gas generation is very flexible. But there is another thing about it. <clears throat> There's natural inbuilt flexibility. This is where it gets subtle. Um, these are, so I call it dance partners. Um, one thing I can't do is dance, okay? I can do a little bit of yoga. My wife's a yoga teacher, so I'm getting better at it. But I can't dance at all. I suspect most electrical engineers can't dance. I don't know. There's some, something about electrical engineers doesn't, I don't, I don't see you dancing. <laughs> But anyway, so I call this slide Dance Partners. Uh, we did it for a piece of work for the Australian electricity market operator a few years ago. And they wanted to know, um, how does the Australian system compare with other systems in the world with regard to integrating renewables? They wanted the sort of lessons learned and, you know, what's similar in our system? What can we learn from you? So they asked for this report that we did. It's downloadable there. And one of the things we looked at is we looked at the correlation between wind and load. Because if you're trying to match, you know, if you go back to this diagram here, you know, if the wind and load are highly correlated, this, this is not a problem, yeah? In fact, it's not a problem at all, because in fact, when it's windy, you have load, et cetera. So in fact, the, the correlation between the wind and load will drive this diagram, okay? So we looked at it, and this is just one, I mean, you can look at this on a daily basis, weekly basis, or you, there's all sorts of ways of looking at this, you know, seasonal basis, but this is the one I use for illustration purposes. We looked at it, we took every hour of the year, averaged it over the year, and just plotted it out, okay? So you can see that in Ireland, if you look at the wind, it's got a diurnal pattern. It tends to be windier in the daytime than the night. We normalize into one. And if you look at the load, it looks like this. Now, I'm not saying they're correlated, but if you go to Texas, this is Aircon Texas, like they are not correlated. Essentially in Texas, what happens is, you know, when the, when the wind is high, the load is low. On average, be careful, on average, because this is an averaging effect. You know, so on average. So, Pretty much you can see that we have, from a point of view of flexibility, we've got sort of inherent flexibility, inbuilt flexibility, because our load tends to be a bit, bit more correlated with the wind, okay? And therefore, flexibility is not something you have to buy. It's something that's actually there, maybe. And in our case, it tends to be there. In Aircot's case, it tends not to be there, okay? So it's a very important part. And I'll come back to this later when I talk about demand side management. One of the things... Uh, that's unique about Ireland with regard to integration is the fact that it's a small synchronous power system on the edge of Europe. Uh, these are shown the synchronous systems in Europe. This is the main synchronous system in Europe. This is Great Britain. This is Ireland. This is the North Earth system. Denmark, interesting enough, is in two synchronous systems. Okay? And I want to talk about adding non-synchronous generation. This is technology integration. So one of the things is so we're not, you know, the definition is fairly broad, but this is talking about new technologies being integrated to the system. So, I mean, uh, Tim and his colleagues are all HVDC people or, you know, power electronics. It's an awful lot more of that technology going onto the system, and there's a whole issue of integrating that. So not just about integrating renewables, it's also about integrating new, new technology. This is renewables, but it goes through a power electronics device. So it's really sort of, 
It's not only is it the renewables you're integrating, but it's actually the technology. This is a very simplistic, um, extremely simplistic view of a power system. Um, you know, in a power system, and the reason why, sorry, I should have pointed out that I show the tandem bike here, is because that is an analogy for a synchronous power system. All these, um, apologies for the, the gender issue, all these 10 gentlemen, um, actually one or two of them could be female. In fact, they all could be female. There you go, shouldn't have said anything. Uh, but these 10, which look like gentlemen, are cycling a bike together. They're doing it together, they're synchronized. If you were on a tandem bicycle cycling, and you decided to go slower or faster than the others, what's going to happen? You're not going to be able to do it. You're going to have to fight against the others. I want to go faster, they don't want to go faster. Who, who here cycled a tandem bike? No one. Has no one in this room ever cycled a tandem bike? <laughs> Here in London, I suppose. <laughs> I've cycled a tandem bike, used to do it in college. Uh, a friend of mine had one, and every Friday night after the pub, we used to cycle around the center of the city about 4 o'clock in the morning. So we, we used to cycle. But anyway, if you cycle a tandem bike, you'll find out that the person, you know, you have to keep in sync with the other person, otherwise it doesn't work. So the analogy is that in a power system, it's the same. Synchronous power system, these blue things here are, just look at the blue ones, they're synchronous generators. They're all effectively, look, they're connected to one rotating shaft, they're connected by chains. So physically, you know, if this one here tries to go at a different speed than this one here, something's got to break. Either the chain breaks or some, something breaks. So physically, they're just like the tandem bike. Now, in fact, this coupling is not actually physical. It's actually, the generators are physically in one location, but the electrical power transmission system effectively, from an engineering point of view, causes this effective mechanical coupling between them. Arrive in new technologies, older wind turbines, modern wind turbines, and solar PV. And essentially what's happening is, first of all, the coupling is not as tight. This is in the older style wind turbines. It's sort of like an elastic band. So yeah, it's still coupled, but not as tightly. And these things, the more modern ones in PV, they're not actually adding to the length of the shaft, because you see every time a generator comes onto it, it gets more weight. So in fact, the, the, the rotating mass that you're talking about, this is the speed of system, as they add synchronous generator, it gets heavier, 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 heavier. And what's the one thing about rotating mass? It stores energy, half I omega squared. And therefore, if you replace these synchronous generators with these things, particularly these, yeah, what happens is this shaft doesn't get any bigger. In fact, it gets lighter. And so the power system itself becomes lighter, 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 lighter. And that means the amount of kinetic energy stored in it is smaller, smaller, smaller. That means if there's an event in the system, the speed of the system or the frequency falls faster and deeper. And this is a problem because if it falls too fast, too far, you get into this zone here. I don't have the slide. I usually show a slide of Italy blacked out or someplace like that. The system blacks out. So when you're trying to integrate this technology, it's not just forget about the wind and its flexibility requirements I talked about. Forget about forecasting it. This is a technology integration issue. In fact, it makes no difference what's behind this. It could be a, a nuclear power plant on the other side of the power electronics. The same thing is going to happen. And the reason you use power electronics to integrate wind and solar is because from an economic and performance point of view, that is the best thing to do. But the same thing would apply no matter what the energy source. So this is not actually a problem to do with integrating renewables. It's got to do with integrating the power electronics that connect the renewables. But they are the best technology to do it. So, the Irish power system, this is a fairly dated, uh, because we're an island power system, and sorry, if you go back to this, each one of these regions is essentially a tandem bike, yeah? This is a very large tandem bike with lots and lots of generators, so it's half I omega squared, it's extremely big. But we are the smallest, well, sorry, excuse me, Malta is smaller, but this system here is pretty small in comparison to the others. And what it has to do is this problem essentially is related to the ratio of the amount of this non-synchronous generation that you have put on with regard to your system size and to do with what faults could happen. So what it turns out is that if you look at these systems here, the Irish power system in terms of where it has been, where it's going, and where it is now has the highest penetration of non-synchronous generation of any of these systems. In other words, our problem that this is describing is the worst in the world. And therefore, we have to deal with it now. So there are, I sometimes tell a joke about this. Um, anyone from Greece? Uh, not that Greece is a joke, but, <laughs> but the only other place in the world I know where this, you know, some Greek islands have a worse problem than this, right? But like I say, in Greece, when the electricity goes out, what do you do? Drink the beer and eat the ice cream.
the reason is they're holiday, they're holiday destinations, whereas Ireland has uh, some of the most advanced Intel fabrication plants in the world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, I hate to use the word, it's a serious power system is the way, word I'd use. Mind you, you know, I, would, I wouldn't mind being in Greece when the electricity goes out. I love ice cream and I love beer, so it'd be fine. So this problem was studied extensively, and one of the papers that came out of it is here, and there's many other reports. But effectively, this problem was studied extensively. This is wind plus imports. This is low plus exports. If you look at it, this region here is, is just not valid, because in fact, you've got more wind and imports than you have loads, so it's not valid. The analysis was done that as you, and these lines here, these sort of semi-diagonal lines, 50%, 75%, represent, 50% represents instantaneous penetration of 50%. And notice 50% of your electricity is coming from these non-synchronous sources. 75% represents 75% of your electricity is coming from non-synchronous sources. What we found is that, yeah, sure, the, the, the rotating mass reduced, et cetera, but you were still okay up to 50%. But what we found is after 75%, you had a major problem. And between 50 and 75%, you had problems, but you could solve them. There was engineering solutions. So currently, we have a limit of 50%, and it's called SNSP, synchronous non or System Non-Synchronous Penetration. I told you I'd explain what it was later. Okay? And this is 50%, and we have a limit on it. And why did I point out in the graph that it's not SNSP? Because I showed the penetration of wind to load. This is actually wind plus imports over demand plus exports. And the reason is because the imports and exports are by HVDC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go into it. Tim knows what I'm talking about. So the reason that disclaimer is down there is because somebody sent an email to somebody in the grid company and says, you're operating outside your limits. And says, why? Well, because the ERC's website says it. But I got a phone call that said, look, Mark, can you put a little disclaimer in there to point out it's not SNSP? So that's why it's there. So if you look at this, this is uh, some you know, early 2015. You can see that at 50% SNSP, we are curtailing the wind. We're, we're dumping it. And this problem is getting worse and worse because look at the growth rate we have in wind. It's getting higher and higher. So we're starting to curtail more and more wind. We still only curtail, I don't know what the numbers are, maybe 2%, 3% at the moment. It's quite small, but it's growing. And as we go towards 40%, it will grow and grow and grow. So we have to do is for the economics is to push this boundary from 50 to 75 5%, which Airgrid believe they can. Let's be clear about it. There's no single power system operator in the world operating here. We're the only one. And we're the only one who's going to push this boundary to here as well. So this is completely unique. No one else is doing it. Uh, they can't learn from anyone. Currently, the SNSP limit is at 55%, and they're working to put it up to 75%. But here's the problem. So this is showing SNSP. This is showing 40% energy on our system, which is 2020. This is showing curtailment. There is some base, there is some curtailment for other reasons to do with transmission and other reasons that I'm not, so there's sort of a baseline of curtailment by 20, by 40%. <clears throat> so, you know, that this is why it doesn't converge to zero. Uh, but you can see that these are projections, that at 50% SNSP, we could be curtailing, you know, 25% of the energy, which makes the economics terrible. So they're going to have to try and bring it in closer and closer. So they're trying to get to 75%. So curtailment rates of 5 or 6% economically are probably fine. So that brings up the whole curtailment issue. So this is a, and the reason I put this in here is that if you look at curtailment uh, issue, one of the things about curtailment is it's no longer an electrical engineering problem. It becomes a whole energy system problem. You've got free energy, essentially. Well, sorry. You've got energy that you have to dump. And then the question is, what are you going to do with it? And then this is where the whole concept of the whole, so it's all about integrated technology, but there's only so much we can do with that. And then all of a sudden you have this curtailment issue. Where do you try and dump that extra energy? So a large part of this, this is a research program called the Energy Systems Integration Partnership, which was awarded last year. It's around 11 million euros. And you can see that in this research project, this is led by, by, uh, by myself and my colleagues. Uh, you can see we're looking at electric heating, we're looking at wastewater treatment. We're looking at the whole energy system, not entirely, but in some way because of this. So saying, listen, you're going to have times you've got this sort of free energy. What are you going to do with it? So I want to talk about Horizon 2020. This will be of no significance to you by July, you know, so who cares? <laughs> that didn't go down well. They must be all voting no. <laughs> I don't know which is scarier, Donald Trump or Brexit. I'm not sure. Mind you, you could probably take a double from, from Ladbrokes, could you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, so Horizon 2020, so one of the Horizon 2020 projects that we're doing at the moment that is related to this whole concept is called Real Value. Uh, and this is a project, and if you look at just, I mean, the reason that, I mean, I'm not here to go through the work packages. I'm sure you're not interested. I wouldn't be interested. But just to look at it, this is communications and aggregation. This is consumer engagement. This is modeling and simulation. This is market, social, economic, this is demonstration. You can see that this project has, you know, it's got electrical engineering and it's got modeling, it's got the consumer. So this whole concept, this multidisciplinarity comes to fore in this project. What this project is about is to look at electric storage heaters. Uh, the company leading is called Glen Dimplex. They're uh, an Irish company. Glen Dimplex are the largest manufacturers of electric heaters in the world. Now, the, 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 who here has heard, heard of Glen Dimplex? Okay, all right. They, they sell an awful lot of their products, though, under other logos. Or like you say, they tend, they tend to buy other companies in other countries, but they don't then put their own logo on it. So an awful lot of electric heaters in the world are actually built by them, but they've got different logos on it. So Glen Dimplex is an electric heating company. In fact, one of their biggest markets is here in the UK. So that's probably why a lot of people know about them. So they've developed a very smart electric thermal storage heating device. It's more efficient. It's IT enabled, you know, it's internet enabled, all that good stuff. And the whole concept is, can you use this as a flexible load on the system? And it's heat. So what you're now doing is you're coupling an electricity system to the heat system. And one of the reasons to do it, I'm not going to, time is of the essence here. And we're, yeah, we're at half of, just these are a bit detailed. But basically, well, in fact, I'll just explain this one here. So basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to run the power system and you're trying to use the flexible load at your discretion, but you're also making sure that the consumer does not get impacted in any way. So this shows some, some work we've done. You're, you're operating the load shifting resource. The two lines here, heat and requirement and heat output, they're on top of each other. In other words, we're saying, yeah, we can give the heat that the person needs. Let's put it on top of each other. So we've done a lot of work in this area. But let me go on to this one here. One, one of the advantages, there's many others, is this curtailment issue. Yeah? That's not the only one. This project is looking at ancillary services, capacity, all, the, all those other things, and energy shifting. But one of the potential advantages is, is that when you're curtailing wind, you, you can dump it into the electric storage heaters. Yeah? But initial results, and these are only initial results, show you. So this is SNSP. This is increased penetration. Level. And these are preliminary results, and they're, they're not, you see, there's no, there's no journal paper. So they're very rough and ready. I'm not saying that they're just illustrative. And what you see is that if you put in more of these devices, what happens is the wind curtailment goes down. Because what happens is when you're curtailing wind, sometimes you say, hey, this is free energy. We'll throw it into the electric thermal storage here and use it later. And it's storage. But it doesn't impact the curtailment rate that much, does it? Yeah? And the reason is this device is just not big enough. Yeah? It's simply not big enough. Yeah? Because curtailment in wind, solar is different, though. Curtailment in wind, when it happens, tends to happen big and happen irregularly. If you look at the sort of all the statistics, now I'm talking about our statistics, I mean, different, wind is variable at all time scales, and you know, it's, it's but some, so when you're curtailing, it's going to be a large amount of energy over a short period of time. And these things can only take so much, yeah? So someone says, well, why don't you make them bigger? Well, you know, they're already bulky enough. So what are you going to do? Build an extension in your house to put the electric thermal source heater? You're not going to do it. So from a curtailment point of view, these have advantages. There's no doubt about it. And they, they definitely have other advantages in ancillary services and energy shifting. And the project will, will, will go into all of those. <coughs> so I go to China. Because in China, they do this at scale. They use thermal storage, heat, thermal storage at scale at an enormous rate. And they also have a problem. Their problem is curtailment of enormous amounts of wind and solar. And it's not because of SNSP, right? It's because of other things. Uh, and solar PV is there. Just, just to, to backtrack a bit, solar PV is different than wind in this respect. Why? Because the sun comes up and the sun goes down. And therefore, the, the solar pattern is more regular. Now, in a minute-to-minute -minute basis, it's still you know, variable and all that good stuff. But actually, if you look at curtailment rates for solar, you suddenly discover it happens a little bit more regularly. And therefore, on a sort of a one-to-one -one comparison with wind, when it happens, the volume is not as big because it happens more regularly. Because it's got this more regular pattern. Okay? And therefore, solar is different in this respect. So these are statistics. The source is raponline.org. I don't know if you know, 
Rapper, a very good group. You, you, you don't know about curtailment statistics in China. Nobody knows. It's, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's a, the di there are difficult numbers to get. But any numbers you do see are large. So this is showing curtailment rates for the first six months of 2015 in China. I mean, they're showing a 42% curtailment rate on wind in Jilin province. It's enormous. The ones in red are solar. I mean, Jilin, and where's Jilin? Jilin province is up here somewhere. And, I'm not, and curtailment happens in China for a multitude of reasons, right? I'm not going to go into all of them. None of them have to do with our SNSP, absolutely none of them. But in northeast China, they use an awful lot of CHP, and it's centralized CHP. So they burn coal, and electricity is a byproduct. The heat is the main product. And they heat enormous complexes of apartment buildings. Like you're talking about five and 600 megawatt CHP plants, or maybe even a gigawatt CHP plant. Uh, but the problem is they're completely inflexible. Yeah? They do one thing. They produce heat. Electricity is a byproduct. If you decide what's, what's happening in Jilin, one of the reasons that this is happening in Jilin is because what's happening is, is that at night, during the winter, and in fact, they have the opposite problem. Their, you know, their diurnal pattern is the opposite. So in fact, they have a, a, an ERCOT type problem as well. So what they end up a situation is the only thing they can do is dump the wind. They can't dump anything else because people would, would, would freeze to death. Now that's a simplistic view. There's a lot of other things going on. There's a lot of you know, transmission problems and there's a lot of sort of regulatory issues as well. But one of the reasons is that the CHP is not flexible. So this is something I actually cut out. Or, or I sent an email the other day by friends of mine uh, who work in China. You know, China energy groups cry foul over Greek cooks. They're actually going to bring the Chinese Wind Energy Association is going to bring the government to court <laughs> about this. But I, the reason I show it is because uh, an awful lot of the problems are not actually physical problems. They're actually regulatory problems. You know, you, you can't go and bring them someone to court about curtailment of wind if it's a physics or again. Well, you can, but it's more than likely than an awful lot. So it's a regulatory issue as well. So that's why I put it up there. So there's other issues as well. So we did some work with uh, Tsinghua University in this. And they looked at sort of taking, so these envelopes show heat and power. This is showing you CHP plus an electric boiler, CHP plus heat storage, and the combination of the two. And what you can do is you put in heat storage. You can actually then say, well, you know, fine, we can turn off the electricity because we don't need it because we have heat storage and we get the heat from that. So that's the concept. Uh, <coughs> so this brown area here represents curtailment. And you can see that business as usual, uh, in comparison with the other cases, you get less curtailment. Because what's happened is you're now putting the excess electricity into this heat storage. But remember, this heat storage is not thermal storage heater that, that is one meter by 20 centimeters by whatever it is. This is in, now I think that should be meters cubed. I'm not so sure where the number, but anyway, this is in large buildings. These are enormous heat storage. And heat storage at scale is much cheaper than heat storage at smaller. And the reason is, but if you take heat storage the size of this room, look at its surface area, and look at the amount of insulation you need to use, do some numbers on it, you find the whole system completely nonlinear. If you make the heat storage 10 times bigger, you don't have to use 10 times more material. You probably have to use 100 times less material. So it's completely nonlinear. The bigger you make it, the more efficient it becomes. So the economics are good. So in fact, if you want to use heat storage for curtailment, build centralized heat storage, enormous amounts of it. Uh, so let me go on to this. 100% wind will have to change how we live. I oh know the wind spill from the offshore turbines accident has, yeah, has, well, it has reached the shore. Anyway, it's a, it's a funny thing. So this is, this is, this is wind in Ireland, uh, 2010 data on a monthly basis. Now, before I go on, I know that there's hourly basis and there's weekly and, you know, and I have other slides. So. Bear with me for a minute. This is an illustration. And if you want to go into all the other time domains, uh, we can later, but not now. So took it on a monthly basis, averaged it, and scaled up the wind so the area in the curve was the same as the load, and just on a monthly basis. So you're basically saying, if you were going to run 100% wind, the, the amount of wind turbines installed in this diagram here would produce the same amount of energy required. The problem is, it's too much in the winter and too little in the summer. We have an enormous wind in the winter, not so much in the summer. And sure, we don't use as much electricity in the winter as the summer, but you know, we, we almost use the same. So in fact, the problem is the excesses in the winter 
and the shortages in the summer. Now, if you tell me for one minute you're going to charge up your car over the winter and drive it all summer, like Elon Musk is an ambitious man, <laughs> but he's never going to be able to do that. Apparently, he's going to live on Mars sometime. So it's not about demand-side managed electric vehicles, right? If you take the Irish power system, we have one pump storage station in the system. We might be able to build a second. We might have a geographical, you know, we might have some, you know, some other location we could build another one or two, maybe. The, uh, the area in the disk curve is 5,000 of them. There are a billion euros a pop. So you're not going to do that. Now, you can definitely overbuild it. I accept that. But what I'm saying is that maybe we should sort of shape ourselves so, in fact, the load profile looks a bit more like the wind profile. Yeah? In other words, shape the load to suit the resource. We, we came about it naturally. Yeah? We didn't design it. ERCOT you know, ended up with a, the wrong correlation. And why? Air conditioning during the summer. So they have a summer peaking yeah, system. And also the wind. So their wind profile and their, and their, and their load profile are just anti-correlated. But I'm sort of saying that you could, uh, you know, you could design your load long term in a way that it's got more correlation. That's the basic point. And maybe you should design manufacturing processes. You know, you know, during the winter, you'll have lots of free energy. Maybe you should have manufacturing processes that can take advantage of it, et cetera. So my own belief, it's not about demand side management. It's about built in demand side management in the long term. And before anyone says that to me, says, what about using solar in the equa equa equation too? Because it's pretty obvious here that what's happening in Ireland is that yeah, surely if we were to put in solar in the summer, yeah, the UK and Ireland are about the same. It does sun, the sun does shine a little bit in the summer, not a lot, but it does. So you definitely could address this issue on a monthly basis by putting in solar PV because you'll have more sun, sun in, the, in the summer. So I don't have the data for Ireland in, in a usable form. So I Googled it earlier, and Great Falls, Montana is a place I know well. I've spent, I've spent several, several weeks there, um, and I've got the source. I, academically, I don't know if this is correct, but it'll do the job. Primus, windpower.com, don't know who they are, but it'll do fine. Simple fact of matter is you can see that the wind and solar are anti-correlated. So if you put them together, you can address this problem as well. So combination of resources is the way to do it. Let's go to Denmark. <coughs> Denmark is a leader in the world. In, a, in integration of wind. It's at 42%. But mind you how it does it. So if you go to EnergyNet DK's website, you can go, just go right, go power right now and you'll find that the URL is down here. This shows you February 2nd, 2016. And you can see that in Denmark, uh, let's look at it here. What's happening here is Denmark is producing 3.9 gigawatts of wind it is consuming 3.4 or 3.5. It's got an excess, but in fact, what it's doing is it's shifting two gigawatts to somewhere else. It's exporting. So Denmark is not integrating its wind. Denmark is exporting its wind. Fast forward to today. It went on. I mean, it just went on today. It was a nice number. I said, look at it. And all of a sudden, they're importing 2.2 today. But interesting, if you look at the local CHP plants, yeah. Now, you've got to remember it's, it's time of year, et cetera. If you go back to here, 298 was the local CHP plants, right? So they were producing a bit of electricity, right? 531 there. And the reason it's higher there is because they're exporting. But if you go, actually, a couple of weeks ago, 704. Basically, the, the CHP plants in Denmark are flexible. They're not tied. They have more control. So they have heat storage, et cetera. So it's part of the picture. So Denmark, essentially, if you look at it, hourly wind farm output, exports, you can see this correlation. Basically, Denmark integrates its renewables by import and export. And also, but their CHP plant are also flexible. I'll skip that one. Flexibility is something that people have talked about. Some people have tried to measure it. We've done some work. So the only reason I bring this, I'm not going to go through this in any detail. We did some work in quantifying flexibility. There it is there. But then we said, well, what happens if I put transmission in there? You know. How does transmission impact the whole thing? So the reason I use this slide is to, there's some real detailed stuff there if you want to read it. But it's to introduce the concept of transmission. Okay? So the advertisement for this, classic energy now is always represented by these things or a wind turbine. Everyone uses them. So I thought I'd use it. So here's a transmission, right? This is the most flexible 
thing on a power system by far is transmission. By far. It is the most, so I said before the Irish power system is more flexible inherently, be, well, not inherently, but because of the correlation between wind and load, and ERCOT doesn't have it. <coughs> and I've talked about gas in our system, you know, demand side management. But actually, if you do the numbers on it, and you do them numbers anywhere, and you do them any way you want, almost certainly, transmission is the best bang for your buck in terms of flexibility. The reason is, is here's some data from, uh, this is Andrew Mills from Lawrence Berkeley Labs. And he looked at, and again, it makes the point about solar. You know, solar, yes, it's, it's variable and unpredictable, but it's got a more of a regularity than winds, okay? But he's shown, you know, uh, one site, five sites, 20 sites, whatever. Transmission adds them all together, so it, it sort of smooths it out. If you look at wind, you get the same thing. So by putting in transmission, you actually even out this, this need for flexibility. And also, you enable it. So in other words, two things happen. You put in transmission, it means you reduce the need for it because you're sort of smoothing things out. But you also get access to places where the, you, know, you can bring in some electricity. So it's, it cuts both ways. Uh, I got a slide deck about two hours ago from a colleague of mine in VTT who's giving a talk in Dublin tomorrow on this issue. And I asked her, could I use this slide? So this is Yuha uh, Kiviluma is, is the author of this. So he did a study. It's not published yet, but was on, I asked him for a reference. He doesn't have it. But he, he looked at all comparing flexibility options, OK? Now, don't shoot me, because I'm just, you know, I thought it was a very nice slide. I was reviewing the slides about two hours ago. And I said, sent an email and says, would you mind if I use this slide? I said, fine. So if there's any hard questions, I'll have to refer you to someone else. But he did a cost-benefit analysis of all these forms of flexibility. And transmission is the best cost-benefit analysis. Party heat is good. And I just went through that, you know. You know, I dumped electricity into heat. So power to heat is good. Demand response without costs. I think what he means by that is that, you know, if demand response comes free, which, you know, to some extent you can say it's marginal cost is zero. I think the battery 100 and the battery 50 is batteries at the moment at their current cost and maybe half the price. I, you know, again, refer to someone else. But battery doesn't give a good cost-benefit analysis. But it's better for PV and wind. Again, for the same reason I said, solar is more regular. So from a storage point of view, from an investment point of view, if this thing that happens called excess happens on a more regular basis for the same amount of pre-flexibility curtailment, you're going to be able to handle it more because it's the volumes are the same over the whole year. But if it happens more regularly, then you have a better chance of, from an investment point of view, dealing with it. So I thought it would be very nice. I asked him to use this head. So not only does my diagram show it, because I, I think this diagram is the only diagram you need. It's definitely the most flexible thing. I don't see anyone having a battery to this. But the, the data does stack up. And any numbers you see anywhere, it always comes up with this. So then enter this. I don't know if you know this gentleman here. This is Charlie Smith. He looks like a certain gentleman called Abraham Lincoln. But he's a real, this is a real person. His name is Charlie Smith. Um, his name is actually James Smith, but he goes by Charlie Smith. But he's got the most common name in the United States. Therefore, he's on the terrorist watch list because they didn't believe him. It's actually true. <laughs> uh, so Charlie Smith coined a phrase, if you love wind and solar, you have to at least like transmission, for the reasons I've given. So you might like wind and solar, but in order to integrate them, transmission is the cheapest way of doing it. But then enters the consumer. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, as all good electrical engineers, consumers should not be consulted whatsoever, but nonetheless, they are very important. Areas. This is actually a protest. I put this one. This is a protest against a transmission line going to a coal plant. So they're, they're trying to stop the transmission going to a coal plant. But nonetheless, I think the point is clear. Pylons out, clean energy now, this is against coal, and this is stop wind, whatever, okay? There's a very interesting paper by Sophoclo, uh, nature. Engineers and economists are ignoring people and miscasting decision-making and action. I'm glad he put in The Economist. It doesn't leave us engineers by ourselves. Um, engineers are probably the least empathetic people in the world, except for probably economists. <laughs> but I think engineers and economists generally come from the same block of wood when it comes to this sort of thing. You know, so you have to consider the consumer. Um, and that's why I said earlier on, what does optimization mean? You know, 
Like I say, I have a wife and two daughters and a son. I understand my son completely. He's starting his PhD in e ETH in Switzerland. That's following his father's footsteps. Uh, my wife and two daughters, I have no idea. I can't understand them at all. Uh, but I love them, but I can't understand them. So consumers are very difficult things to understand, extremely difficult, OK? So people say there's a trilemma. You know, they talk about security, you know, security supply, or sorry, e e economy, security supply, or sorry, oh, there, there he is there, Mr. Putin. You know, security supply, sustainability, and economics. There's a three that they call it the trilemma, but I believe it's a trilemma plus the consumer. You know, the consumer is actually part of this and needs to be considered. Human beings do strange things. And therefore, in any integrated energy system, you have to take them into account. In fact, my own belief is that they're the single biggest missing element of what we do. We understand the physics, we understand the economics. You know, we're not accounting for the consumer. Engineers and economists are coming up with solutions that they think are right, but the consumer may not want them. So I'll be very quick. Europe. I, I've mentioned in China that the sort of, you know, that these problems are not just sort of physical, they're sort of regulatory issues as well. But this is this is a I've used this several times in several slides, but I think it's worth, you know, this is something that appeared in Bloomberg. It's 2012, it's quite old. You know, it says windmills overload East European's grid, risking blackout. Uh, this is a report from the Commission on some of the issues related to it. But this is a slide, and I, I asked Ronnie once, so <laughs> he won't mind me using it again. So Ronnie Bellman's, uh, a Belgian colleague of ours, did a very nice illustration of this. And you've got Spain, Portugal, France, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, Deutschland, yeah, Switzerland, Italy, not sure, Austria, Poland, and this is Slovenia, I think, whatever. But anyway, this shows you unannounced wind power. So this is scheduled power exchanges. And this is what they thought the day before was going to happen. They thought that, you know, 2.169 gigawatts of electricity was going to go from, from Germany to Netherlands, etc. Right? But because of forecasting errors, this is what actually happened. They're totally different. And the problem is, is if you're trying to run a power system and this happens, it's a reliability issue. I'm not saying you can't handle it. I'm saying you know, it's better to know what's going to happen in advance to handle it. And one of the reasons, I won't go into it. There's several reasons for it. But essentially, they're policy mistakes. Yeah? They're just you know, classic policy mistakes. So this is a, a good report from Mark Oliver, Dieter Helm, et cetera. But anyway, you know, how did they get it so wrong? You know, so they, they, you know, the crisis of the European electricity system. There's an awful lot of policy mistakes. And again, I'm not saying they're all because of this, because it didn't take into account the whole system view. This problem is a whole system view problem, which is Germany just says, oh, I'll put wind in the system, we'll be fine. They didn't take into account that, in fact, their, their wind and their forecast errors will cause reliability problems for everyone else's power system. So they do not take the whole system view. The reason they don't take it has to do with politics and to do with the fact that the Germans do not like certain policy instruments because they are not acceptable politically. Why would you curtail wind and solar in Germany when you've subsidized it so much and tell the consumer, you're paying a fortune for it, and by the way, I'm curtailing it every now and again. It's not politically acceptable. So it's politics that's behind this. OK, a global perspective. So I'll just finish up on this. So um, if you, just back to energy system integration. So this is the energy system integration facility at the National Renewable Energy Lab in the US. It's a 135,000 square foot building. It's called the ESIF Energy It's built around this concept of whole energy systems, about integrating electricity, gas, heat together across all scales. It was opened about two or three years ago. This is uh, the energy systems catapult, which just started in the UK in the last six months. It's got an official launch, I think, next week in London. I was invited. I won't be here. I'll be in Paris. And this is the, the Strategic Energy Technology Plan for Europe. This is a sort of, it's been around for about six or seven years, but this is a sort of a, I don't know, an update version of it, if you want. And it came out, I think, about 18 months ago. If you look at this document here, the whole concept of the integrated energy system is almost dominant in the document. There's two things dominant in the document, right? The consumer and the integrated energy system. They're the two themes that if you read the document, that, well, sorry, from my point of view, maybe I'm wrong, but if you read it, they're the two major themes. It's one system, 
It's got all these different parts. We have to make it work together, and the consumer should be at the center of it. This is a purpose-built facility for it, and the UK is investing heavily in things like this. So in fact, globally, you can see that this whole concept of energy systems is, is becoming bigger and bigger. This is the organization that uh, Tim spoke about earlier. Ourselves, Imperial, NREL, KU Leuven, PNNL, DTU, and EPRI, and some others have all come together to form this organization called the International Institute for Energy System Integration. It's there to try and, I'd say promotes the wrong word, but from a scientific point of view, we believe this is a really important area. And it's not just, you know, it's not just engineering. Now, mind you, all the people who started are engineers, which is probably the wrong place to start, but that's where we started. Uh, it's definitely about the consumer economics regulation, etc. And within Europe, they have, under the SEP plan, they have the European Energy Research Alliance. And inside the European Energy Research Alliance, they have joint programs. This is an attempt by Europe to coordinate energy research in Europe to deliver on the SEP plan. So what they've got is they've got these joint programs. And the idea is that most of the energy research, most of the research money in, in Europe does not come through Europe. It comes through national governments. In the US, it's different. Most of the research money in the US comes through federal government, and little comes through the states. Europe's the complete opposite. Therefore, if you're trying to achieve this set plan for Europe or whatever, then you know, the, the commission only has so much money. Most of the money lies within the, the nation states. And therefore, ERA is the concept that we'll set this up and try and get it to coordinate energy research across Europe. That's the concept. So they have 16 or 17 of these joint programs, one in wind, solar, geothermal, CCS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So at December 2015, they approved a joint program in energy systems integration because of the importance of this area. And its launch will be in May 8th and 9th in Dublin 2016. So energy systems integration is an increasingly important research area. It's fundamental to the su successful decarbonization, in particular the integration of large volumes of renewables. And it's a large interdisciplinary. It's an enormous area. Yeah, and it's definitely interdisciplinary. And I do not believe there's any one university institute can solve it because it's such a complex problem that it's definitely something that is you know, very well suited to international collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, Mark indicated he'd be happy to take questions. Um, no one took not, me up in not, the offer during the talk. No, not one person but, took me up in the offer. I'm sure we'll have some questions from the audience now. If you could just wait for the microphone to reach you, and, and if you could just announce your name and affiliation before you ask, that would be helpful. Mark Linder from uh, Bell Potter. Thank you very much for your lecture. Wondering what you think of tidal power and the possibility of a fleet of lagoons in the UK and what that does for the integration challenge, recognizing that sure. tides are sort of spiky but regular. Okay, uh, I've done work in that. I've done some calculations on the capacity value published, I don't know, six, seven or eight years ago. Tidal power is a niche resource in, on a global context. I mean, you know, it's, it's extremely large in some places, but from a global perspective, if you look at the IPCC report on renewables in 2011, um, the, the amount of viable tidal energy that's there is quite small. So it's a niche, first of all. Um, it's still variable. Uh, and it's very predictable. I mean, it's a fine technology. It's, it's reasonably close, you know, it, put it this way, it's an awful lot closer economically than wave power. In fact, it's infinitely because wave power doesn't seem to work at all. So I think it's a good technology, it's predictable, it is easier to integrate from some perspectives, but it's a very small and niche technology. Is that a satisfactory answer? But here, would it be more important in the UK? Uh, I couldn't possibly speak about the UK being appropriate. Um, my understanding is that the UK definitely has some resource, probably the Severn, is it? Yes, yeah. the Severn Estuary. Yeah, the uh, Severn Estuary. Um, with plans to build tidal lagoons. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's some, there's some in Ireland as well, but it's not a, it's not a, it's all got to do with the, it's all got to do with the moon and the, you know, the various bits and pieces. And some places there's a large amount of it. But I don't think, I, I know the numbers that we did for Ireland indicate that we might have 200 megawatts of the stuff. Now, I don't know if you're saying, we, we, we need around 10 gigawatts of it, so it's a very small resource. In our case, it might be 2 or 3%. I suspect the UK might be about the same. So it's not a very large resource. 
but as you know, Mark, the, the technology for tidal is, is yeah, nearer, and here it's oh, technology yeah. is well understood, whereas yeah. Wave still faces yeah. enormous challenges yeah. on, on, at least on reliability. Yeah. Right, where are we going for our next question? Uh, go to the woman in the, what is this, fourth row. Hi, uh, Clara Imperial, um, student, PhD, uh, PhD student here at Imperial College. Um, I'd like to ask you again about the system inertia thing. So it is becoming um, you know, a big topic, and I think in the UK also, National Grid um, always publishes this system operability framework, and it's becoming more and more important there as well. Just, I'm just like curious about your expertise about different systems across the world. In what kind of systems is this really becoming a limiting, limiting factor, system inertia? So there are some islands in Greece who have had these limits for years. They have SNS, well, they didn't call them SNSP, but I think I've, I've got a paper that date back to 1993, I think, where they had a power system dynamics limit, which is essentially the same thing, of 40% on some small island in Greece. Um, it is in ERCOT in Texas because Texas is you know, classic Texan. They might be part of the continent, you know, you know, North America, but they are not synchronously connected to the rest of it. So it's starting to happen there because they have an enormous amount of wind. Hydro-Quebec is starting to think about it because it's also, it's isolated synchronous systems that are, that they are small and they have a large amount of renewables. But the, the leaders in the field in this area in terms of it's Ireland, it's their Greek islands, Texas. I would suspect New Zealand, well, New Zealand has an awful lot of hydro, so, now, so um, New Zealand might also. I don't see why the UK is so worried about it. It's still a very large system, relative, relatively speaking. So, But look, er, as you put more and more of this stuff on, it will happen. In fact, the US, yeah, the US did a study on it, continental United States, the Eastern Interconnection, which is the largest interconnection in the world, and they did a study on it, and I was part of the study team. So all I'll tell you is at the start of the study, I says, there's no point in studying this. It's not a problem for another, you know. They still did a study, though, um, and they found it's not a problem. So it's got to do with very small systems with very large amounts of non-synchronous generation. Just one follow-up question, if I'm allowed. Um, so do you, could you imagine that potentially the electricity system would change such that maybe inertia doesn't become that big of a yeah. problem anymore? Is that an idea as well? Or? Yeah, there's a, so there's a project called Migrate, which is a European Commission project that we're involved with that is looking at very high penetrations of power electronic devices in the system. And one of the work packages in it is looking at 100%. In other words, no synchronous generation at all. So my belief is that that's where we're going. We're going to completely non-synchronous systems. However, the analogy I'll give you is that it's like changing the engines of a Boeing 747 as across the Atlantic because, you know, on power systems, sometimes, you know, when the wind isn't blowing, it'll all be synchronous generation. And then a few hours later, it's all wind. So you have a system that's switching between a synchronous and non-synchronous system. So it's a really interesting challenge. It's a very interesting engineering question. And it's because the system's not, has to be backward compatible. We can't just switch out the entire system and switch in a new one. So that's a very good question, and it's a very interesting area. Completely power electronic systems is probably where, it's, it's definitely one of the areas we're going towards. He likes this, it's his area. But it is, it, is, it is where we're going. And there's people in the US working on it, there's people in Europe working on it now. It's a good, it's a very, for PhD students interested in this area, it's an incredibly interesting research question. How do you operate systems that are Synchronous sometimes, non-synchronous other times, and maintain reliability. It's a really interesting question. Thanks. And on the left-hand side. Uh, Tim Rothery from the uh, Association for Decentralized Energy. Thank you very much for your lecture. It was very interesting. Um, there was a, a very bland sort of technical detail question. I'm really interested to know what they were storing the heat as in China, because it didn't look like the big hot water thermal stores that you see in Denmark. I just wondered I'm how no, it was Yeah, there. I could send Chan Ching an email. I'll send it to him now if you want. I have no idea. Because okay. <laughs> if you see, if you see, hold on, I use slides I put down, source, you know, so I can always defer to them. Just the, we, we, he gave a talk at the IEEE Power Engineering Society meeting a couple of years ago, and he was talking about these enormous storage devices, but I'm not sure what he... I presume it's probably water. I'm not sure. It just, it, yeah, the photograph just didn't look like <coughs> yeah. the gasometer type thermal source. Anyway, that's just maybe they're um, not the right things. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah. But the, um, the point is, is to, is to store it at scale. Yeah. The yeah. basic point. Uh, that's the basic point. And it is much more efficient to, to store at scale than it is to store at small scale. Yeah. 
Um, and the other question, this, this power electronics thing, and I'm not an electrical engineer, but you suggested that this problem of the loss of rotating, or, or well, it's not even loss of rotating mass, but it's the connection with the, the, through power electronics. You, you seem to apply that was a, an issue for all electrical generation going forward. Does that mean that future, if we had nuclear or whatever, future thermal assets, which at the minute are rotating mass contributing to system stability, would that, do you envisage that going? Okay, so it is sort of related to the question I was just asked, but let me say one thing first. Um, oh, wait a minute, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, yeah, just, just on one point, wind turbines <coughs> do have a rotating mass. It's the blade and whatever. So they do have this kinetic energy there. The problem is the power electronics doesn't allow it to be connected to the system. Solar PV does not have it. <coughs> so solar and wind are different in that respect. So there are technologies out there from GE and others who have what they call pseudo-inertia response. In other words, the power electronics connects to the system, but in the event that it's a frequency event on the system, it actually deliberately slows down the wind turbine, therefore sucking the kinetic energy out of the wind turbine. So it's using it in an intelligent manner. Now, I'm not going to go any further than that. It's not. There are issues around it, but it is a tech. So wind can, pro can produce pseudo-inertia response. Solar can do nothing unless you put storage into it. On your other question, it's back to the question you asked. I mean, it's not a case. I don't think it's a case <coughs> that we're going to 100% power electronics. And it's not a case that nuclear is going to go power electronics. It's just a case that we're in this transition. If you go 100 years forward and you say you want a completely renewable, it's almost certain that it will be largely power electronics. But I think there will always be some synchronous generation in the system because I think that biomass, for example, is probably going to go through a synchronous generator, and synchronous systems have some advantages. But it's, a matter, it's, it's an incredibly interesting research question. And if you want a career in it, I'm 53. Tim is a little bit younger, older. Only a little bit. <laughs> Um, if I was a young academic at 25 or 26, I would think that this, is, this whole question you just asked is, you know, it's good for 30 or 40 years. It's a, re it's a really interesting question because the power system we've developed is a synchronous power system. It's AC. <coughs> it works absolutely fine. We can't just throw it out. We have to, it has to keep working 24-7, 365 days a year. You can't unplug it. You have to try. So like I said, if the analogy is the Boeing 747 or that's what the U.S. make. We'll call it an Airbus. Airbus 380 flying from Heathrow to Dallas. I don't know, does it fly there? I don't know. Anyway, they go east. You know, it's like changing the engines on that in flight. You, that's the analogy. Because you know, you're going from the system is, you know, mainly synchronous. I operate it one way. The system has become mainly asynchronous. I operate it another way. How do you do that and maintain reliability? It's a really interesting question. Okay. There's a slight... Oh, yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, good evening. Uh, I'm a student at France Business School, Surya Gupta. I would like to know, uh, what is your view on uh, ITER, that's the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor being made in France? The fusion one? Yes. So this is a completely personal opinion, not professional in any way. I think it's a complete waste of money. Well, I just, I just think it's always been, you know, and I, don't, I, I know very little about it, so I can't really say. But just, so not a, not a scientific answer, because I just don't know. But it's always 50 years away. Always, you know. It's like chasing a bus, yeah? And we've poured enormous amounts of money into it. I don't know. I, I just think it might be just a waste of money. But that's just that, you know. I think it's a question of whether it's going to make a contribution by... 2035. Well, that I can say no. Right. In which case, it doesn't put us on a pathway to the no. right place for 2050. No, no, no. Yeah. It's, not, it's, okay. it's not in the... No, sorry, from a long-term research perspective, there's definitely things they do that are valuable, etc. So I'm not saying you'd stop it, but I, I suspect we've probably put too much money into it, but I don't know. It's not going to have any impact by... Yeah. Put it this way, I'll be <coughs> long gone before it has an impact. Thank and you. in fact, you'll all be long gone. <laughs> <laughs> but just not me. Unless there's someone in here who's minus age. Well, well seeing as we're throwing several different technologies at you, Mark, but, but you left yourself open by talking about energy systems integration. So 
a debate that's, that's moved backwards and forwards in the UK is about the future of building heating between what we thought a few years ago that we would electrify building heating and supply it through a decarbonized electricity system. Uh, we thought we might be using ground source heat pumps and the rest. We've toyed with the idea that we might be doing it through heat networks. We seem to be swinging back that it might be we retain our gas network. We just put something lower carbon in yeah. it, like syngas or, or biogas. W I imagine the same sort of debate is happening in yeah. Ireland, but I don't know where it stands. Yeah. I think, I mean, the UK is probably similar to Ireland. We have too many, well, it's definitely in Ireland, we have far too, our, our, our building stock is far too diffuse. We don't have too many apartments. Now, London is a much more densely populated city, so it probably lends itself a little bit more to it. So we're not suitable for centralized CHP. We're just not suitable for it. If you do the numbers on it, <coughs> I, I just don't know where it's going, to be honest with you. I really don't. I, I think hybrid heating systems will make a, there are systems out there that can burn gas, electric, you know, they sort of do hybrid, now they're expensive. But a hybrid heating system on a system like this can sort of say, well, when the electricity is dirt cheap, I'll use that. And sometimes I use, so a hybrid heating system might be a way to do it, but they're very expensive. So I would say some sort of, and it's probably a hybrid as well, on a national basis as well. But it's a very difficult, in fact, there's too much emphasis gone on electricity because it's easy. That's not coming from electrical, it's, it's not that easy. You know, but, <laughs> But heat is a real problem, and we've sort of, you know, the low-hanging fruit is in electricity. And the reason it's in electricity is because you want to integrate enormous amounts of renewables. It turns out electricity is relatively straightforward to do it, yeah? Wind turbine, power electronics, electricity, do it, yeah? Heat, much more difficult. In fact, there's a proposal back in Ireland to use um, biomass in our, in our coal burning station, right? Using biomass in a coal burning station is insane. Is that why the UK is doing it? Oh, okay. <laughs> but, okay, sorry, but it isn't, it is insane. You'd be better off burning the biomass. I have two um, solid fuel stoves in my house. They're both, Dan one's Danish, one is Swedish or Norwegian. Very expensive, very nice, very tasty, but incredibly efficient. You know, the efficiencies are 90%. Why would you burn biomass? in a power station when you can burn it in your house. So I think there's, you know, and I think if you look at it, if you go to Germany, you take the German situation, the German situation is that you would think the Germans are very renewable friendly people, yeah? But they've killed off their heat pump market, why? Because they have enormous subsidies, all the subsidies for renewables are paid by the consumer and they also subsidize industry because they don't want industry exposed to the prices that are more competitive. And the, the net effect of one policy of the Germans to promote renewables, which is get the electricity consumer to pay for their own subsidies and to pay the part of industry, is that heat pumps, even if they were cheap, don't make any sense because electricity is so expensive. So this is a classic case of market signals getting the, you know, completely wrong. I think the future is probably going to be a combination of these technologies. In some description. Okay. It wouldn't be my area of expertise. So time is running away from us a little, so I'm going to take a group of questions. So we have two over this side, if you would, Nathan. Uh, Judith first, and then... Uh, from Please the keep it to my topic. I've drifted <coughs> off it. I'll do my best. If um, you want to talk about politics, I'll, <laughs> I'll go there as well. <laughs> um, I'm Judith Ward from Sustainability First. Um, I wonder if I can just link up or come back to some of the points you were making about shaping load profiles to match wind. Um, and also where the consumer sits and all of this. Because as I understand it, in Ireland, with your smart meter rollout, um, there's also going to be, or already is perhaps, a sort of mandated time of use tariffs. And I was just wondering where that sits, say, in your view about trying to shape load profiles to match wind, and also, um, you know, whether that is actually going to help with end bills as well. So I'm not completely familiar with where our smart meter rollout is, but we've done a demonstration project and we've done analysis on it. But the smart meters themselves have not been rolled out at scale at all. And I'm not too sure where the debate is. I know one of the debates is around this, is around uh, they want everyone to have a, uh, they're, they're going to give everyone a smart meter plus a, a, a fancy box. And like my view is, what are you giving them a fancy box for? They have one of these. So that's my only contribution to this is that, you know, that I think that it's very, I think smart, I think smart meters, you want my honest opinion, I think smart meters will not have as an impact as people think. I don't think the evidence is there to say they will. 
I think the consumer will have a huge impact. But I mean, smart meters rolled out to everyone is like, it's a classic engineering economist solution. Here, you'll all have one. Why? You all want one, do they? Who here wants a smart meter? There you go. Okay, it's definitely off my area, but my understanding of shale gas is that the resource in the United States is clearly better at a, yeah. at a macro scale. Europe's resource is probably far less. And there are some environmental issues about it, but I, you know, I, I was in Cornell University for 11 weeks one time, and in Cornell University, the two leading experts on either side of the equation are there. I've heard both sides, but I, no comment. U.S. shale gas is much more predominant than it is in Europe. Okay. Um, Right, I'm going to just take two questions. So the one from the front, and then we'll go to the back on the left-hand side as well. Maybe you can hear both questions in the interest of time, and then, and then Mark will pick up the answers. Thanks. It's Rufus Ford from SSE. It's just a real quick one, um, going back a couple of questions to talking about the heating technologies and your earlier comment about large thermal storage being a cheap way of storing energy. Don't you require heat networks, really, to do the really big-scale um, heat storage? Do you have a question? So as you go up there, yeah, I mean, if you have 20,000 people living within one square kilometer, it's a very small heat network. I mean, that's, you know, in China, they live in enormous, you know, very high-rise buildings, very densely populated, so it's a small heat network. I think in the UK and Ireland, places like that, that number of people would not live in that sort of combined space, and therefore the network gets bigger. So I think it's horses for courses in different places. Um, hi, I'm Rachel Stanley. I'm in independent, I guess. Um, I was wondering, so you, following what you were saying about smart meters, one of the things that I was seeing about smart meters is they will eventually enable demand-side management um, as they will enable utilities to have a much, or the suppliers to be able to actually understand the demand and to be able to see where demand is and actually communicate to customers about that, which is kind of one of the first stages towards getting them involved is how do you see demand-side management within this kind of integrated system? Do you think it has a place? So first of all, why do you need a, a smart meter to enable demand-side management? The major benefit of smart meters that I know of is that the utility can read your meter without going to your house. That, is, that, that apparently is the single biggest benefit. I can, put, I, can get a, I can do it in the lab. In fact, I'm sure if we went down to the electrical engineering department here, we could get a, we could get a soldering iron, a few bits and pieces, and I could start measuring electricity consumption and broadcast it to this phone. I do not need a smart meter to enable demand side management. They, they're just not needed. But then, so. There's some bit of kit that you would use. Sure. Your yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my own belief is I, so there was a, there's a report out, if you Google it, go E E R E, it's the uh, energy efficiency, E E R E D O E, it's a demand side management report that just came out around in the uh, start of March. It was, a, it was a huge report done on a study on the Western interconnection in the United States about doing demand-side management at scale. And I was a part of the study team. So they looked at demand-side management, Western interconnection in the United States, which is around about two or 300 gigawatts. So it's around about half the size of the continental European system. It's a big system. And they did a ground-up study in terms of all the demand-side management that was available. They aggregated it up. I'm not saying it was the best, it, it was the best comprehensive study I've ever seen in terms of demand-side management. And what it shows you is, in terms of what demand-side management can do now, what I mean by that is existing demand. My view is that we should design demand in the future so that it's more compatible. So I want to you know, caveat that. I think demand-side management in the future will be very big, but I think the existing demand with its constraints 
it turns out that in terms of what it can do for you, right, uh, in terms of some of the services it can provide, there's enormous amounts of it, yeah? But in terms of the services that are incredibly valuable that we want for renewables, there's not a lot of it. And in other words, it came out as not exactly the most useful thing to have. It's marginal. But in the future, if we design the systems, it'll become much more valuable, particularly as more renewables come into the system. So it's a, I show the electric car and things like that. I don't think demand side management is as big as people think with the current existing loads and the way we're thinking about it. I think in the future it could be. Well, thank you for your questions. I think we've had a very healthy debate. We've also had a very interesting lecture, and I'd like to thank Mark and for I both his... I made remarks about things I know very little about. Well, you, you were game because you were engaged with the questions, and, and that makes for that an was, interesting that was, debate. So 30% of that was pub talk. <laughs> well, in which case, it's time to get to the pub to mm. continue that aspect of the debate. So let's thank Mark again in the, in the usual manner.